Welcome to my channel. This is another episode of Daily News Clips. But before I get to that, I have to thank you for coming to my channel, for watching my videos, for subscribing, and most of all for the comments that you make. I really enjoy interacting in the comments with you. And thank you for the growth of my channel. It's amazing how much my channel has grown. I have several items for you today in today's news. The first one is an article from the Epic Times. <clears throat> the, the title of the article is Pfizer and Moderna COVID Vaccines Efficiency Exaggerated, Effectiveness Well Below 50%, Researchers Say. If you read the article, it talks about research that they've done, and one of the things that they've shown through this, and this is a troubling problem that appears more and more frequently nowadays, is that the scientists have fudged the data to make it look better. And if we're going to have any faith in science at all, science has to be done honestly and ethically. And when it's not, it doesn't just give us false information. It also destroys our faith in science. And that is a bad thing. And as always, I'll put these links in the description so that you can read them yourself. The next thing I have is an interview with Netanyahu. Now this interview was done by a gentleman who's been studying urban war warfare for some time. And he, he talks with Netanyahu about the ongoing conflict in Gaza. Well, I'm very pleased to welcome you, Colonel John Spencer, to Israel. Um, you're perhaps the world's expert on urban warfare. We're engaged right now in intense urban warfare in Gaza, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, glean from your insights and uh, to answer some questions you might have. So welcome. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you each time that I've been welcomed to Israel, and, and what an honor, <laughs> to be honest, to, to interview you during one of the most, I think, historic wars mm. of our generation in general. And I uh, hope I can explain that to other people but never had an opportunity to ask a, a world leader during a war, a generational war, what I think is a generational war that is, is an urban war, because that's what I study, sir. Um, but what I like to tell people is I throw people who forget the wars of last five years ago, 20 years ago, especially 70 years ago. Well, you mentioned the ba Battle of Manila. Yes, sir. Um, and I found that uh, peculiar, particularly instructive because here you had a city uh, half the scale of Gaza. Manila was 1.1 million. Yes, Gaza sir. today is 2.2 million. Gaza and its, uh, and its uh, various parts. Uh, and there were 35, there were 17,000 uh, uh, Japanese troops there. Well, there are twice that many um, Hamas and uh, Islamic Jihad uh, terrorists, about 35,000. So there was a tunnel system there. We have uh, an underground, vast underground terror tunnel system. And what I learned from you is they had a tunnel system, which was the sewage. Yes, sir. Now you look at the, uh, I think the interesting thing is what was, how many civilian casualties were incurred there and how many civilian casualties are incurred here. That, that I think is the most instructive thing and that I learned from you. Well, thank you, sir. Um, it's, it's unfortunate how people forget history of what is the realm of possible in, when you have an embedded enemy, especially of that size, in a, in a network of tunnels, which I've written about as well, sir, that while there were tunnels in Manila, and the Japanese did connect the sewers to fighting positions, um, but they were also going to embed themselves in there, and you had to go in and get them out. And I think, um, which is really one of my first questions, the reason in which the Battle of Manila had to happen is that there were a thousand, over a thousand American prisoners of war. Basically hostages. Hostages. Mm -hmm. And 2,000 civilians, both American and British, uh, being held by the Japanese for years, being tortured. So General MacArthur wanted, he didn't want to destroy Manila, he loved Manila. His father served there, he served there. Mm -hmm. But he knew that the American, Americans needed to be saved. So they started the operation um, and 100,000 people died in that battle. 100,000 people. 100,000. 
Okay, we have incurred considerably fewer, and I'm glad we've incurred fewer because my uh, instructions and the cabinet's instruction, the war cabinet instructions to the army is to do everything to minimize civilian casualties. We have uh, incurred um, probably around 16,000 civilian casualties. Each one is a tragedy. The ratio to uh, combatants killed is uh, now down to less than one to one. Now down less than one, one to one. Uh, so, uh, but we're facing, I think, uh, a tougher situation than the American uh, uh, Army faced uh, in Manila, yes, because uh, they're, <clears throat> this is a deeply entrenched uh, uh, enemy that is, t takes uh, the militarized, to use, I think, uh, your language, they militarized all of Gaza. They yes. took the hospitals, the schools, the residential quarters, the uh, above ground and the underground uh, space and turned it into one huge terrorist compound. And we have to come in there while they're trying to keep the population in place as a human shield and root them out. And we're doing it with far fewer casualties than the only equivalent battle that I can see, which is Manila. That's the one that's close because when I look at Mosul, it's not even close. Nope. Mosul had no underground uh, terror system and had only three to 5,000 uh, terrorists, is that right? That's, right. Uh, that's it, about Just that. Right. Three to five uh, and still 10,000 people died. 10,000 civilians died there. And 10,000 soldiers to take the city. Oh, I see, okay. So it was ten, So in the Battle of Manila, we, uh, we only lost 1,000 American soldiers taking the city. But the Iraqi security forces lost 10,000 soldiers mm -hmm. to defeat 3,000 ISIS fighters. Well, I think we're doing better. Uh, and I can tell you that um, in our situation, victory is within reach. It's not uh, a distant victory. It's within reach. We've destroyed three quarters of the uh, terrorist fighting battalions of Hamas. We have uh, another quarter to go. That's two, uh, two battalions in the center of uh, the Gaza Strip, four in, uh, uh, in Rafah, and we intend to complete the job while evacuating the civilians. And while So that's the first five and a half minutes of a 30 minute interview. Obviously I'll put the link in the description. One of the things that he points out is that <clears throat> if you, uh, as, as some in the world are suggesting that you go to a ceasefire, if you uh, go to a ceasefire and you don't allow them to go in and take out the rest of the terrorists, basically the terrorists of one, in order for Israel to win, they have to eliminate every single terrorist. And they're, they're doing that in the most humane way possible, which is almost seems like an oxymoron. I mean, war is not humane, but uh, they've been forced into this position by the evil that Hamas has committed. And so now they're there to complete the task. And it's gonna take a lot of work. It's gonna take more dead bodies more civilians dying, uh, it, it's not pretty, but it's necessary. The next article I have is, and this one just makes me shake my head. This is from Cheryl Atkinson. Cheryl was a reporter for CBS and went out on her own because she wasn't being allowed to tell the story she wanted to tell. She writes uh, a headline, U.S. gives Haiti millions more tax dollars after armed gangs take over, billions in aid disappear. When, when will our leaders ever learn? When will they ever learn? You just cannot do this. You, you can't, money, money given to gangs in Haiti is not going to solve a problem. It's not, if anything, it's going to make the problem worse. And yet we see this over and over again with our government. They give money to the wrong people. They just gave money to Iran again. And all it does is create more trouble. You would think that they would get some sense, but no. That's too much to ask for, I guess. And then the last thing I have is uh, an episode from Joe Rogan where he he basically uh, goes off about normalizing uh, race hatred towards white people. 
this guy's going to make it. They're, they're, it. Those are insane that they're using the Hitler one as an example. Yeah. It's really like showing that like Hitler was crazy. Right. Like, you can't be racist. This is my thing. We'll, we'll have only one race, so no one can be racist. Like, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's one of the things that the SPLC accuses me of, though, is that I promoted the white genocide theory, which that is not true, but... What are you going to do about these things? Um, well, there's plenty of people that have said crazy things about white people lately that yeah. you're allowed to say that I just tries to be nuts. I just said that if the logic of CRT was played out to its conclusion, that it would end in a in a genocide of whites, which is a completely different thing. That word "if" means a lot. If it was taken to its fullest extent, I think there's also a problem with, you know, when you tell people that. A group of people are responsible for things or a group of people like just completely di composed of individuals with completely different lives right. and everyone's got different experiences and we say that that group of people is either bad or that group of people was responsible for everything like as soon as you do that you allow othering that's right othering is the number one problem we have tribally culturally that we can look at other human beings as if they're not us and this is what's going on in gaza in israel right now and that's what's going on with this guy i'm not going to defend whatever but right. this dude like the counter reaction eventually to relentless identity politics is for the other side to start saying okay identity politics right right or wrong what it does is it creates more of itself and it's like it's contagious it makes people more and you have to wonder if that isn't the goal You really do have to wonder if that isn't the goal. Is, is it the goal of critical race theory is to create a race war? Is that what the goal is? Because it certainly looks like it. It certainly looks like stirring up hatred between races is going to do nothing but create more hatred towards races. And eventually, whoever is on whatever side is going to take ar up arms. That's the history of mankind so uh, again I, I just I wish I had good news some days but boy it's hard to find good news nowadays just about everything is is insane bonkers out of whack completely crazy and you have to know about it before you can do something about it so that's the reason why I do these daily news clips. As for you, my followers, I pray that you will live an abundant life and that you'll be healthy and that you'll live a long time and that God will keep you safe from harm. I pray he'll do the same for every person that you love. And I also pray that you will be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, you'll make your requests known to God. And the peace that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This is the Vietnam Mirror Vet, out.